Welcome to The Quest from the studios of the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us as we journey together on this pilgrimage of faith. And now your host, Sarah Soto. Hey, y'all. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Today, we celebrate the Memorial of the Passion of St. John the Baptist, and I'm so honored to have a return guest for a part two, uh, Dr. Dan Mayola from Life Giving Wounds here in the studio. Welcome back, Dr. Mayola. Thanks for being with us here today. Great to be back. Great feast day to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited for those who weren't able to join us for our first uh, time with Dr. Mayola. Let me give you a little bit of background. So Life Giving Wounds um, is an incredible, incredible ministry. We're going to share all about um, about it with you today. But Dr. Mayola is the president and board chairman of Life Giving Wounds. He is an adult child of divorce who earned his PhD in theology of marriage and family from the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family in Washington, D.C. He has been leading retreats and support groups for adult children of divorce or separation since 2015 in the Archdiocese of Washington, and in 2018, he founded Life Giving Wounds to spread the retreats, support groups, and other ministry to adult children of divorce or separation around the country and internationally. And he does this with his lovely wife, Bethany, who is the vice president and board secretary. Now, Dr. Mayola, for those who weren't able to join us for the uh, first session, uh, we were talking after the show, we didn't really get to dive super deeply into the many aspects of the incredible book that you and your wife co-wrote, Life Giving Wounds, and I'm grateful to be able to do that with you today. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar or interested in a ministry for adult children of divorce, what is that? What is, can you summarize uh, for, for those who have never heard of anything like this? And certainly I hadn't until I came across your ministry. What's the... Um, what inspired you and what's the the goal of life giving wounds ministry for adult children of divorce or separation it's very simple to give voice to the pain of adult children of divorce separation and to bring them transformative healing in christ through many different means tried and true but some new as well that's beautiful I like it. Uh, we could start as an adult. Uh, you, so you yourself and I am also we are we are adult children of divorce and know very well the uh, the pain and suffering um, and oftentimes isolation that comes along with that. Uh, and there are many different wounds that you address in the book. And if we had, say, three or four days to <laughs> discuss it on the radio, we could probably uh, get get past the surface, but for the sake of time, um, we're going to talk about two of those wounds today. Two of the wounds that uh, those whose parents divorce um, can experience or do experience, and the first one is the wound of a broken identity. The wound of a broken identity. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so in our first part, we discussed grief and depth. Mm -hmm. um, and once you become more aware of the wound, you, you can't help but to notice very often certain identity lies have creeped into your life. Like, mm -hmm. have, you, have you ever had this experience where you're struggling with something and then you think, like, I'm so stupid. I'm such a failure. They, there's, like, these self-loathing thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, we never, but we never ask, like, where does this dialogue come from? Yeah. And very often in adult children are divorced. It's, it's from our parents' divorce, it's from the dysfunction, it's from the trauma, and we need to name that and mm -hmm. reject that script as the wound talking, mm -hmm. and that's not the core of who we are. So a key part to healing is overcoming the self-loathing and not giving into the self-loathing talk. That's, yeah. a, that's one of the earliest steps uh, that we can heal. But to do that, we need to pinpoint, not just generally like I just did, um, that, oh yeah, it's really my parents' divorce or childhood trauma. We, we need to get more nuanced so that we can find the way out. So mm -hmm. something we talk about in our book is what is the particular identity lie? Where does it come from? And some of the common lies or things that can lead to you know that self-loathing, mm -hmm. one of the things is emotional homelessness. Mm -hmm. So this when our parents divorce, well, let me just back up. We as a child, as the fruit of our parents' union bond, no matter how brief or how formal it was, whether it was a one-night hookup, your parents got married and divorced, 
after 20 years. We're always the fruit of this bond. So we're always negotiating our identity between these two people in a way that the spouses are not because we're the fruit of these two people always. Right. And so we're always trying to negotiate our identity. But with a divorce or separation, when those two parents aren't around in our life or live in two different homes, we now have to go back and forth between these, you know, as it's been described by Marquette, two different worlds mm -hmm. and make sense of it. And that's really, it's really hard for an adult. It's really hard but especially for a child. And so we right. experience this emotional homelessness. Hmm. Yeah, so as an adult child of divorce, I, I think, and I've discussed this with you, I think just a little bit offline, but going back and forth to my parents' house, um, you know, I, I wasn't proudly telling my friends that my parents were divorced and I was, you know, traveling back and forth every other weekend. Um, but I had to kind of come up with a way to shield myself from it. And so I was try to, it was covering up right vulnerability, but I was essentially saying, "Well, I've got two bedrooms, right? So I've got two sets of this and two sets of that." And and uh, but yeah, it was impossible, and and uh, it was really really difficult. And it's still like you said, for an adult, it's hard, um, but for a child, it was uh, yeah it, yeah it broke my identity. And you you say something in your book here that really um, it really touched um, a part of my heart that I didn't even realize was was injured. Um, you're talking about how. When a parent's union is severed, um, you're, you, as the fruit of their union, starts to ask those questions. Um, so what does that mean for me? Who am I now, right? And because especially, um, oh gosh, it almost, it almost pains me to say it out loud, but um, because it's like you, well, because you're also an adult child of divorce, I'm sure you experienced this, but it's like you, I didn't keep a diary when I was five years old, but if I had, this could be a quote from it, which uh, you say, adult or children of divorce may ask, may question their worth, wondering why was I not worth the effort and sacrifice to stay together and work on the marriage? This feeling of rejection can be exacerbated if one or both parents enter new unions, perhaps with new children, and the original children feel superseded. That's probably one of the most, it's, it's almost that I, <laughs> I can hardly articulate it really because you, you don't want to, you see that your parents are in pain, right? If you're old enough to even pick up on it, you see that your parents are, are in pain and uh, you're afraid to sort of add to it. So then it becomes this internalized, um, well, if I was worth loving, they would have stuck it out. They would have made it work because you can't, you know, you can't comprehend the complexities of adult relationships when you're so little, um, even if you're a teenager, you know. And so that um, that part of being torn between those two worlds um, was very, very, very hard. Uh, but then you you delve into I don't know if you <laughs> plan to talk about it, but um, you talk about the loss of for an for a child of divorce. You talk about the loss of childhood, play, and rest. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what it means to lose childhood, play, and rest when your parents divorce? Yeah, but I just want to respond to what you just said because mm, that's mm -hmm. such a deep, deep suffering. Please. Um, when you reflect back on that, why was I not worth enough? Like this feeling of I wasn't enough. Mm. I mean, it, it comes up either through those questions, why was I not enough to stay together? But it also comes up as you go between the two homes, can't keep the peace, you can't, you know, uh, be everything your mom and dad wants, you know, right. you can't make sense of these two worlds. You can't be unaffected, you know, and you feel like collapsing. You're like, why, why am I not enough? And, and that's right. one of the roots of the later dialogue we have in our heads. I'm just a failure. Mm -hmm. I'm so stupid. You know, these like definitive statements. Yeah. I'm not enough, but that's rooted in a long history of wounds and it, it can be really freeing to, to acknowledge that because you're you're right the other dynamic is you're feeling these feelings but at the same time you don't want to be a burden you don't want to be disloyal because you love yeah. your parents so right. how do you negotiate all that and mm -hmm. so again that's why it can be really freeing as adults to say okay i can love my mom and dad but still acknowledge this is what i was going through yeah. this is the hell i was going through yeah and just sit with that and Oof. love your younger self who is yeah. still present in every self-loathing thought that's coming up and that helps us break that cycle um now yeah. to your second uh question the loss of childhood so this is another way so again some of these might apply to the listeners some might not maybe mm -hmm. you felt emotional homelessness maybe not 
Um, but loss of childhood is huge. Uh, we had to grow up really fast, be very independent. And um, uh, we lost the finer um, gifts of play, rest, mm. dependence upon another, receptivity yeah. of another. Because that growing up fast is not insignificant. We have to become very independent, look out for ourselves or our siblings. Again, we lose play, rest, dependence, receptivity. All these things are needed for thriving in our relationship with God and others. Yeah, there's there's actually so much to say. We're going to take a, a short break here in a second. But for those who are just tuning in, we're doing a part two with Dr. Dan Mayola of Life Giving Wounds, an incredible ministry uh, to bring healing to adult children of divorce and separation. If you want more information about their amazing ministry, you can visit lifegivingwounds.org. They have a calendar and a list of all their upcoming retreats, including an online retreat if you can't make one uh, in person that's coming up starting it's on Wednesday evenings starting on Wednesday October 2nd so that's lifegivingwounds.org highly 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 recommend their book I don't often highly recommend books you can find it at lifegivingwounds.org we're going to take a very short break we'll be right back with Dr. Dan Mayola of Life Giving Wounds writes in 1 Corinthians 1 17, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Many evangelicals see this passage as an indication that baptism is not necessary for salvation. But is this true? The answer is no, and here are some reasons why. First, I don't think Paul meant I don't have authorization to baptize. If that were true, well, then he would have acted in disobedience when he baptized Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus, which he tells us about in the preceding verses. But we don't want to say that. It's more likely Paul was being hyperbolic in order to stress, one, the focus of his ministry, which was to preach, and two, it doesn't matter by whom you're baptized, which was the topic of discussion within context. Is Paul denying the necessity of baptism? I don't think so. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. We are thrilled to have you join us on The Quest, where each moment holds the promise of spiritual growth and the opportunity for profound transformation. Hey y'all, it's good to be back with you. I'm your Monday, Thursday host of The Quest, Sarah Soto, and today, back in the studio, I have Dr. Dan Mayola talking about his fantastic ministry, Life-Giving Wounds. I say it's fantastic, I say it's incredible, there's a lot of different words, but for me, it's been, it's been life-changing to find their ministry. As an adult child of divorce myself, picking up their, uh, the book that he co-authored with his wife, Bethany, uh, Life-Giving Wounds, has brought so much light and the beginning of what is probably the most uh, profound healing directed at the most life-changing event that I've ever been through, um, which is my parents' divorce, uh, their separation and divorce. And so, uh, like we were talking about before the, before the break, there are so many things that I think I would like to <laughs> dive into, but for the sake of time, um, we're talking about two of the wounds uh, of divorce um, that two of the wounds that adult children of divorce can go through and experience. And like uh, Dr. Mayola was saying, some of us may identify more with other areas um, that we're talking about um, than others. But I do want to bring to light, we're talking about the first, the first wound we're talking about today is the wound of a broken identity, which is such a big, 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 big wound um, for children, adult children of divorce. You say in your book, Dr. Mayola, that, uh, and this is something that, yeah, like I said, I could have written myself, so I'm sure a lot of other people who are ACODs, adult children of divorce, can relate to. <clears throat> uh, you say that it can be difficult for adult children of divorce 
to rest and have leisure, to just be. It may be a struggle to take off adequate time from work simply to delight in family and friends. Some may fill their time with distractions and their hearts and minds may feel restless all the time. This inability to rest and to play can affect the ability to receive joy. Now, if my ability to receive joy is affected, um, and this could be part of the reason why or the, the reason why, I want to address it. You know, if there are people listening that have a difficult time just being, right, just being in prayer with the Lord before the Blessed Sacrament, just being with their, with their parents, with their friends, with their family, um, or just being alone, you know, and quieting their mind, that's, that's part of the, it should be a good part of the human experience, right? Just being, uh, we're meant, you know, to rest. The Lord commanded us to rest. Um, and so what do you say to those who struggle to quiet their minds and their hearts? Um, how, do they, how do they navigate uh, the difficulties of that uh, if they're adult children of divorce? Yeah, I, lo I love this topic because this has been an ongoing struggle in my own life, but so many right. of those I serve as well. Um, first of all, just to recognize that it's a goal. It's a goal mm. to rest and delight, you know, in, in that this inability uh, to rest and to delight in the good around us um, in family and relationships is part of the wound. It's not the way things were meant to be. Again, so many of us, right. especially in American society, just think like, hey, it's the way life is. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of joy out of our work and doing things, but we're cutting off a huge part of our humanity mm -hmm. and we probably struggle with burnout and a lack if we don't have this other side of our humanity to rest, to receive, to be dependent that brings yeah. joy uh, equally as much as work might do it. And it balances it out like we're, we're made for both right we have six days of work and one day of rest like the rest is important and the work is ordered towards the rest right mm -hmm. we don't just uh rest to work some more <laughs> like no we rest for rest's sake um it's it's so to speak the most important work but so first of all just to see it's a wound and something we need to work towards and to not be ashamed sometimes people are ashamed like why can't i just be present to my family just yeah. be present why am I always thinking about the worst possible scenarios? And mm -hmm. and we beat ourselves up like, oh, the most present thing we should be able to do, we're not able to do. Um, yeah. So instead, the first step of healing this wound is just say, hey, this is very common. This comes from a wound of growing up too fast and, you know, the ability to rest as kids. So it's okay. It's okay to struggle with this. It's okay not to have shame. And then have as a goal to rest, to mm -hmm. play to recover these virtues uh, that are not just good for children, but for adults as well, and delight yeah. uh, and receptivity. And there's all sorts of amazing ways you can do that uh, yeah. once you become self-aware that this is a wound and something you need of healing. Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I feel like uh, sometimes before kind of realizing that, I was like, well, clearly everybody else can do this thing and I can't do it, so I'm broken beyond repair. But you're right, I mean, part of the, the biggest, um, yeah, the initial step is acknowledging, right? And I'm having a hard time like relaxing and resting and um, and it's something I need to, to name. And like you said, I think it's really important for those listening that they not um, look at themselves as, um, yeah, less than or irreparable, right? Christ came to redeem all of us and um, and every aspect of us, right? And so it's I think it's really beautiful to, to acknowledge that. And I think we, I can't remember, uh, I think we touched on this a bit, but the, uh, inability to rest and 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 play and just kind of just be um, and that loss can growing up too fast can kind of go uh, in a couple of different directions um, you talk about how it can go can lead into a fierce independence um, which I'll, I'll quote from your book directly uh, there are some scenarios that can create a fierce and unhealthy independence an inability or unwillingness to depend on another person for help, love, affirmation, and working through our feelings. As a result, we don't seek out help, healing, relationships, or love as much as we need to. This attitude of doing everything for ourselves bypasses the virtue of reciprocity and friendship and love by eliminating the need we all have to be receptive to another who loves and cares for us. Um, I mean this in a good way, like a knife to my heart. 
<laughs> like a knife okay. to my heart. Growing up too fast uh, has certainly um, created a struggle in my life and in the lives of many people that I know who, have, who are adult children of divorce. Um, it's created a deep wound of trying to, and you can't do it. So it's, I say trying to, trying to rely completely on yourself and not needing anybody else. And I'm sure you, I, I have more to say, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to, to add to, or to expand upon, um, fierce independence for our listeners. Yeah, it's a huge thing. So notice I describe it as fierce independence. There, there is a healthy independence, a healthy sense of self that is right. needed. It, mm -hmm. It's all about integration and, and avoiding the extremes. That's what it means to have virtue. Um, yeah, and, and exactly as you described it, you, you grow up too fast. You have to take care of yourself. You're in survival mode to so become mm -hmm. fiercely independent. So first of all, just you said knife to your heart. It, it, it hurts to recognize it. This is true. But again, yeah. um, I want to flip that on the script. Like you should love yourself. Mm -hmm. Like when you notice young Sarah Soto had to do this, like, yeah. wow, that was amazing. That was necessary for a time. But as you move into adulthood, healthier relationships, uh, healthier, uh, you keeping the dysfunction at the bay, that's when you, in a healthy, good relationship, you want to rediscover the reciprocity, the receptivity. And yeah, okay, if you've been schooled in this way of living for 18, 20 plus years, mm. or however long before you recognized it was a problem, right. like, it, it, it's going to take a long time to get back these other uh, this other side of your humanity that has this longing to receive, to be dependent. So just start small. I always try to say one receptive act of love a day. Mm, you know, I like that. Re receive the love of your husband one in one way. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's as simple as, okay, when when he loves me, I'm not going to doubt it. And, or if I have those thoughts like, oh, but why do you really love me? You know, like yeah. just delight in it. Like, oh, my husband loves me. Or, you know, I mean, this sounds silly, but this is something my no. wife and I do. Lean into the kiss for longer, right? Mm. They say that uh, married couples who uh, really love each other, they, one of the habits they do is at least a six-second kiss every day. It's not this, like, quick thing, right? So it's like yeah. leaning in. It's delighting. There, there's more of a receptivity there. And that's actually a real uh, a, a habit that my wife and I try to try to do. And there's actually some fun research google uh six second kiss for, for married couples so i've actually so, heard of this and i do a lot of six second counting um but it, well <laughs> okay. I, okay so at first i did and then i uh then i stopped counting so then it's become habitual but yeah it's really impactful that connection um for you know longer than a kiss on the cheek it's like hey how's it going it's good to see you you know but to to connect yeah it's been really to receive that love is really it's been very healing but but to go deeper um we've got to receive ourselves from the Lord. And, mm -hmm. th and this is why prayer cannot just be an activity, but a receptivity. So we have to also examine our life of prayer. Are we just doing a bunch of things? Like that's important. That needs to be integrated, right? We need to read. We have to have our prayers, but are we receiving? Do we read the, the word of God? Like that's a pass back receiving. Do we, mm -hmm. you know, ask God, what do you say to me? And just be quiet and, and shut up and just listen um we've we've got to receive from the lord uh hard truths for instance that we don't agree with things like that like there has to mm -hmm. be this receptivity probably the best place is adoration too where you just be before the lord I, so I, I can't emphasize enough uh eucharistic adoration if you don't know what it is it's foreign to you it's coming before the blessed sacrament and the posture is just first being with the lord before any doing if that's mm -hmm. all you do, just be with the Lord. Um, one other thing, to get at this deeper receptivity, there used to be this like debate of, well, you just need a certain quality of time versus quantity of time. Research has shown that they go mm -hmm. hand in hand. If you, if you want a certain quality of time, you need to spend a quantity of time with somebody. Um, so mm -hmm. I also recommend, like, if you really want to get to that deeper stage of receptivity and being and dependence, you've got to spend the time with the Lord or with those you love. Uh, it, it, it can't be, you know, just your most tired moments or just a little bit. Like you've got to sometimes spend a quantity of time 
to get at that deeper receptivity and being. So for adoration, I always find at least an hour um, is needed at least once a month, hopefully more if we can do more, uh, to get through all that yeah. active thinking and just receive. Yeah, do you hear that, folks? Hard truths you may not want to hear with Dr. Mayola. Go to adoration. And I, one of the, some of the best advice I've ever gotten is, um, you know, I had a hard time quieting my mind had a hard time kind of settling into adoration. And um, when I first began to go and um, some a very wise priest once told me, um, and I'm sure this is a reference to one of the great saints of the church, but he said that adoration is not a time for necessarily just a time for you to go. And like you said, right, read your prayers and, and, you know, say the things and kind of unload everything on the Lord. And certainly there's right, there's time um, to do that. But it's allowing uh, the true presence of our Lord and allowing him to see you, you know, just to see you fully and, and completely and, and in all your weakness and all your vulnerability, but all the, the beautiful ways that he created you too. And so, um, yeah, that's probably a, an integral part of your retreats, I imagine, is, is teaching people how to, <laughs> well, to go to adoration and um, to really just to be, um, to be. We don't really, mm -hmm. we don't really be. You can quote me on that. <laughs> uh, no, we do, we do, we do, 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 do. Uh, and that has its place. It just needs to yeah. be integrated. It needs to be integrated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so there, are, like, like last time, there are a lot of things that I, I want to cover. Um, but we're talking about two of the major wounds um, that adult children of divorce um can find themselves working through when they first recognize, hey, my parents divorce or their um, the lack of unity, right? That they perhaps never had sacramentally or whatever it is uh, has affected me, you know, throughout my life. And those initial steps towards healing, um, you're recognizing some of these wounds. And we're talking about the wound of a broken identity, which is a big one. Uh, and then we're gonna delve into another one here shortly. But uh, for those of you just tuning in, I'm talking with Dr. Dan Mayola of Life Giving Wounds. You can find more information on their website at lifegivingwounds.org. And they have an, um, so much beautiful information on there and they have a great shop, including the book that Dr. Mayola co-wrote with his wife, Bethany, Life Giving Wounds. It's available on Kindle, but if you're a paper person, uh, you can order their book online um, and anywhere you buy books. But it's absolutely incredible. Highly, highly recommend, not just for those who are adult children of divorce or separation, um, but for anyone who knows someone, which most of us do, who is an adult child of divorce, especially spouses of adult children of divorce or separation. We will be right back after a very short break. This is Father Jim Netto of the Diocese of Portland, Maine. In Krakow, Poland on the 2nd of June, 1938, the Lord Jesus himself directed a young Polish Sister of Mercy on a three-day retreat. Sister Faustina painstakingly recorded Christ's instructions in her diary, that is, a mystical manual on prayer and divine mercy. These instructions became Faustina's weapon in fighting the good fight. Jesus began, My daughter, I want to teach you about spiritual warfare. Secret number three, do not bargain with any temptation. Lock yourself immediately into my sacred heart. This secret reminds us that in the Garden of Eden, Eve bargained with the devil and lost. We have recourse to the refuge of the sacred heart. In running to Christ, we turn our backs on the demonic. Recall also, that when the devil came to tempt both Eve in the garden and our Lord in the wilderness, he took advantage of their being alone. That is one of his strategies. So we need to stick together to avoid his attacks. Be not troubled, however, no matter the great the temptation that assails you. Let the enemy rage at the door, for we are sure he cannot enter but by the door of our consent. Let us keep the door closed and see that it is properly fastened. Then there is nothing to fear. Finally, be assured that all the temptations of hell cannot sully a soul which is displeased with them. Let them do their best then. The apostle St. Paul suffered terrible ones, and God, out of love for him, would not remove those temptations. So come, have courage. Let your heart belong to Jesus. Preserve me, O God, 
for in you I take refuge. This is The Quest from the studios of the Guadalupe Radio Network. Share the show with a friend. You can find us on social media. Want to listen again? We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Uh, One of my favorite guests of all time, Dr. Dan Mayola from Life Giving Wounds, Uh, is joining us again for part two to dive more deeply into two of the wounds that adult children of divorce may find themselves struggling with. Uh, But first and foremost, when, like he's been mentioning over and over again, um, the first step is recognizing, right? Recognizing um, that that you need the Lord, recognizing that, um, recognizing that you need the Lord and inviting him into these areas of woundedness and brokenness. And you so you and your wife, uh, Bethany, so eloquently uh, help those who are adult children of divorce or separation uh, identify these various lies um, and these deep wounds that perhaps people have been struggling with their whole life and have no idea how to name. And so it's, it's such a great uh, gift that you are offering those uh, or, or, or those of us who are adult children of divorce help in identifying, naming, and then, you know, rebuking uh, those those deep wounds. And I think, well, like I said, I just want to cover so many things, but we were talking before the break about a fierce independence. You said there's a healthy independence, of course, right? But a fierce independence uh, is also, um, we were talking about how it's, um, you know, you don't want any help or, or healing or anybody, you don't want to rely on anybody. Um, but there's also, um, you know, you're, you're depriving those who love you, right? Of, I mean, it's like, it's, it is, we're made for communion. And when you're made for communion, uh, and it can't just be this, what, I'm the only one helping, I'm the only one helping, um, but I don't need any help. No thanks, right? We're depriving our friends, our loved ones, our spouse of the, of the great uh, grace and joy that comes from helping us from, like from yeah from carrying our 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 yoke with us and so on the other end of that um you mentioned something called enmeshed dependence which is very different from fierce independence i'm going to quote your book and then uh, ask you to to share a little more with our listeners enmeshed dependence means becoming so invested in relationships that one loses a healthy sense of self detachment and independence from others Enmeshed dependence is different from a healthy dependence within independence and different from mutually reciprocal friendship that necessitates a whole and healthy self to give and to receive love. What it, when, adult, when an adult child of divorce experiences, how can someone um, identify that they're experiencing enmeshed dependence as a wound, part of their wound? Yeah, I, I think the biggest sign of it that comes up is there they're excessively concerned about pleasing a parent Mm -hmm. or pleasing the other. Mm -hmm. And their whole identity is taken from whether or not they can please them or achieve a good mood. And we we actually end up taking responsibilities for even their feelings Mm -hmm. and and their actions. Um, Now, of course, we have to take ownership for our behaviors and how they affect people. But they make their own choices, too. The outcomes of their life is also a result of their own choices. And you're not responsible for their own choices that lead to their own mood swings and things like that. You're partially, but not fully. And so, uh, again, a big sign is you, you become excessively fixated on achieving a certain outcome with a person, a relationship, a mood. And I see this all the time with a certain parents. Um, yeah. And you draw, even worse than that, you draw your identity from it. So if mom's mm-hmm. having a bad day, I'm worthless. If dad's having a bad day, I'm not enough. I'm the failure mm-hmm. for that. When the reality is, it's probably the result of a lot of choices that they've made. Yeah. You played a small part, maybe with your certain behaviors that you need to take ownership for, but you're not wholly responsible for the way they're acting or even chiefly mm-hmm. responsible a lot of times, and especially not as a kid when they should be trying to teach you <laughs> how to regulate all these emotions. So yeah. those are some signs to indicate, yeah, you really have an enmeshed dependence and you've lost a healthy mm-hmm. sense of self. Yeah. And the Lord wants to meet you there too. The Lord wants to meet you there too. <laughs> and, 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 here, and here again, to offer the hope side of things, if you recognize yeah. this, 
is first recognize this unhealthy pattern. This is a wound. You got caught up into as a at a young age, right? Mm. Probably didn't even realize it because young kids have a natural inclination to want to help their parents. So there's something good in wanting to please your parents that needs to be mm. integrated. This is not all bad. So right. listeners, repeat after me. This is not all bad to want to please, love, and care for your parents and for others. It's when it becomes excessive and you take your identity cues. That's where we need to put a boundary, mm. a boundary in place and cultivate a healthy sense of self. And a great place we see this is in our baptism with the Lord. Mm. When we become dependent on God, he gives us our greatest freedom too. Or, or think about our creation. At the time we become the most dependent on the Lord, when we're created, he gives us the greatest freedom of free will. Yeah. Or, again, in baptism, the freedom of discipleship. Now, that can drive some people nuts. Like, why does God give us too much free will to sin? But it's because he respects a healthy sense of self. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I, I give a lot of talks to teens, and I always tell them, too. I mean, they say, you know, why did we even have to be tempted in the garden? Which is a whole other talk, uh, <laughs> a whole other <laughs> show. But... Um, yeah, like, I just, is it really, I mean, if you had no other choice, if you didn't even have the option to reject God, all you'd have to, all you would do is choose him. And that's not, and, you know, love in, in love requires the free choice, you know. And so a that's self. Just, uh, a self. Yeah. You know, we yeah. wouldn't have a self. We'd be little robots, which yeah. is not fun. That's no fun. <laughs> uh, exactly. And so. Not the fullness there... of life and love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, I mean, obviously, like, the freedom that Our Lady had, right, to to say, I'm the handmaid of the Lord, it makes it all the, I mean, she could have, she she could have said no, right? And then that's the freedom in the, oh, anyway, another show, another time. But the, for the, we have we have another wound we want to talk about. And I, and, um, yeah, the mesh, the mesh dependence, was that clear? Hopefully. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the, maybe the last point, and I'm sure if you, I mean, if you have another one, that's fine too. But the last point I had um, for the wound that you and Bethany speak about in your book, Life-Giving Wounds, um, the wound of a broken identity, you talk about a mixed label of victim. A mixed label of victim. You say that one label that should be addressed directly is the label of victim. Some adult children of divorce feel uncomfortable when it's mentioned that they were true victims of their parents' divorce or separation. Victim here acknowledges that they were objectively hurt by their parents' decisions. But some adult children of divorce have been labeled as victims in an inaccurate sense. So if you're a victim, if you are a victim of your parents' divorce, right, it hurt you were, obje it's like an objective fact that it hurt you that your parents were divorced. What do you mean when you say that some eight adult children of divorce are labeled as victims inaccurately in an inaccurate sense? Yeah, the inaccurate sense is, uh, y y you hear this term, the victim mentality. That if mm -hmm. you acknowledge that there is a wound here, you're wallowing in self-pity, you're stuck in the past, and you're powerless to change it for the good. And oh, goodness. Uh, incredibly negative. Now, some people fall into that. We, we need to reject that. You know, our first episode talked about rejecting the victim mentality, which to me is a sin against hope. Um, mm. But... Unfortunately, in our society, there's not enough nuance because the victim card is played a lot of times in, in bad mm -hmm. ways and politics and things like that. Oh, yeah. But it's it's so quickly played. If you just acknowledge any fault or any wound that your parents may have had that has hurt you and it impedes healing. So that's why we need to have nuance. There's a good sense of victim just acknowledging right. there's this objective wound that I need to work through. But the bad sense a victim that we need to reject and, and get out of our minds if we think of ourselves as victims is this way is that we're powerless to change it mm. and and so mm. you owe something to me because i can't mm. do something for myself right <laughs> and, and this is so twisted uh because yeah. again um with the lord's now maybe you owe, maybe you need to amend some behaviors but sure. uh we're not owed on account of our pow powerlessness to change the good. Like, that's just such a lie. We, mm -hmm. with God's grace and help, can change all wounds for the better in some way, in some fashion. And we shouldn't just wallow in self-pity. We go into the past in order to live more fully in the present and in the future. 
We don't we don't just go in there to sit. Uh, I mean, sometimes we need to sit to uncover the wounds, but but we we need to be moving, moving yeah. forward, you know, as well. So that's the sense of victim in the victim mentality that we need to reject. So it's very clear yeah. we need more nuance on what definition of victim are we are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, as we as as time tends to run it feels like it runs so short and there's so many things i want to um, ask you and and expound upon but um you said we agreed we would talk about a couple of the wounds that you and bethany um talk about in the book life-giving wounds that you co-authored together and the other one um so we talked we've been talking about the wound of a broken identity and again for those of you just tuning in we're talking with dr dan mayola of life-giving wounds for more information on their ministry Helping adult children of divorce uh, or separation find healing, you can visit their website at lifegivingwounds.org. That's lifegivingwounds.org. The other wound uh, we want to touch on today is the, it, well, the wounds. It's the wounds of anxiety, anger, and sin. Uh, I, I'll just, right off, the, uh, right off the bat here, I just want to say that I feel like anxiety has become like a really hot word you know over the last maybe i don't know i don't know if it was since the big life-changing event that we had happened four years ago or what but it just there just seems there's anxiety over uh, you know like i have so much people have real anxiety right like i've seen someone very close to me have like a full-blown panic attack right and so there's a spectrum of of anxiety that we can have um i thought because the person close to me that has uh, very intense and real like physical panic attacks I always thought that that's what anxiety looked like and so I never ever thought I had anxiety I was like well it's so good to be anxiety free over here I've never had to breathe into a paper bag turns out uh, I have some pretty real anxiety as a result of some woundedness in my parents divorce but because it didn't look like you know shortened uh, my shortness of breath, I thought, wow, it's so nice to be the most relaxed woman in America. Uh, and it couldn't be further from the truth. It's just that God has a really good sense of humor. And uh, it turns out that reading your book, Life Giving Wounds, I'm, I've, I'm just going to, I'm going to quote this and we can, we can talk about the wound of anxiety, um, anger and, and sin. You say that anxiety about impending disaster um, can, well, you First, you describe anxiety as a feeling of fear, worry, nervousness, or unease, rooted in possible or perceived danger to our life or well-being or concern about something with an uncertain outcome. Different people can feel anxious about different things, but we can identify several common ways that anxiety impacts adult children of divorce, both at the time of the divorce or separation and, and far into the future far into the future. I, I say that I just have to, I have to have a little bit of a sense of humor about it because it's like, I'm, I've reached this point in my life where <laughs> it's just like now at this age, at this ripe old age, I'm finally coming to, to, I sort of name these things and it's, uh, yeah, I just have to be, it's good. And I'm very grateful. And I hope that no matter what age you are, cause I know that you, you and uh, your team serve a, um, a wide variety, right. Of people from all different vocations and ages and backgrounds and, and so it's just, um, yeah, like I said, I have to have a little sense of humor about it because I'm just, I thought I was old enough to have kind of <laughs> figured some stuff out. Turns out I'm just like it's okay. beginning. It's okay. Um, we're, we're, it's a new layer <laughs> until the day yeah. we die. I, yeah. We need to approach healing in a different mindset. You know, mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, I got another problem. I'm mm -hmm. so damaged. Like, no, it, it's an opportunity for growth that a lot of people never get to experience. So I have a little yeah, mantra, yeah. every every layer of the wound is a lesson for love. It's just how mm -hmm. the Lord is teaching you how to love. There's other ways to learn how to love. So just, you know, embrace it. Embrace it. Every every layer of the wound is a, le a, well, a lesson for love. It's true. It's true. I, yeah. So we're going to talk about the, the wound of anxiety, anger, and sin uh, after a short break. Again, we're talking with Dr. Dan Mayola from Life Giving Wounds. Do yourself a favor. Pick up a copy of their incredible book, Life Giving Wounds. It's got a beautiful picture of our Lord run on the front cover. For more information or to buy that book, which, again, I highly recommend you do, visit lifegivingwounds.org. I'm your host, Sarah Soto. I'm with you Mondays and Thursdays here on The Quest. We'll be right back. This is 
Franciscan Media Saint of the Day for August 29th. Today we celebrate the martyrdom of St. John the Baptist. The drunken oath of a king with a shallow sense of honor, a seductive dance, and the hateful heart of a queen came together to bring about the death of John the Baptist. The greatest of prophets suffered the fate of so many Old Testament prophets before him, rejection and martyrdom. This great religious reformer was sent by God to prepare the people for the Messiah. His vocation was one of selfless giving. The only power that he claimed was the Spirit of the Lord. Scripture tells us that many people followed John, looking to him for hope and perhaps special powers of his own. John never allowed himself false honor. He knew his calling was one of preparation. It is John the Baptist who pointed the way to Christ. His heart was centered on God and the call that he heard from the Spirit of God speaking to his heart. He did not hesitate to accuse the guilty, did not hesitate to speak the truth. Confident of God's grace, he had the courage to speak the words of condemnation, of repentance, of salvation. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. We are thrilled to have you join us on The Quest, where each moment holds the promise of spiritual growth and the opportunity for profound transformation. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. It's so good to be with you all today. It's a great joy, as always. Uh, I have such a great guest with me today, Dr. Dan Mayola from Life Giving Wounds. We're talking about a couple of the wounds that adult children of divorce or separation may find themselves find, discovering <laughs> later in life, uh, or maybe earlier in life, uh, discovering as a result of their parents' um, divorce or separation. And there's a lot of different ways that can go, uh, right? The parents could have a long marriage. They could have perhaps never been married, but there are some common ways that adult children of divorce or separation can be wounded. Uh, and the wound we're talking about here in our last segment is the wounds of anxiety, anger, and sin. Um, you talk about anxiety, Dr. Mayola, as a, a sense of foreboding. I, I know this well. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, and, and just to start the frame of the conversation, anxiety and anger are completely normal reactions to trauma, uh, parental divorce, dysfunction. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's you know what we do with it that can become sinful, but in themselves right. they're neutral. But for mm -hmm. instance, if we take anger and I insult you, well, that becomes a sin, right? So yeah. it's not the feeling, and so the feelings we got to work through. But importantly, integrate, because they're trying to protect us, right? Anxiety is yeah. trying to protect us. Anger is trying to protect us. So, again, it's not wholly bad, but it needs to be modulated. And Christ does want us to work towards that peace of heart. So yeah. foreboding anxiety. This is the phenomenon of whether things are going well or not, I'm constantly scanning for what's going to happen, the problems. Mm. And then it sabotages often our relationships mm -hmm. because, you know, sometimes these people are called killjoys. Like you're in the middle of a beautiful experience and you're like, yeah, but what about this? Or <laughs> you just resolved an argument and then you're like, ah, but this is still unresolved. Or like, you, you know, um, it can sabotage the love uh, that we desire. So there's yeah. this general sense of foreboding, but it's it's not – innate to the person or even mm -hmm. a particular relationship but comes from the wounds again very often adult children divorce and you see this both in high conflict and low conflict and low conflict have a foreboding sense of uh fear anxiety of life because the greatest thing that they experience as a kid the, the love of their mom and dad was all of a sudden in low conflict removed and so you feel yeah. like, well, if this great thing that I thought was stable and good can be removed, any good thing can be lost. Yeah. And so it creates this foreboding anxiety. That's low-conflict marriages. In high-conflict marriages, the foreboding anxiety can come about 
well, mom and dad snapped at any moment or mm. could get really violent, alcoholic or whatever. Um, and so you're kind of like walking on eggshells. So the anxiety, the foreboding sense of anxiety is that, you know, you were training your heart to always be on guard because that yeah. was the way parents raised you. Right, you uh, and knew. it could be a ama- yeah, you never knew if your needs were going to be met. You never knew if um, they were, they were going to hurt you or harm yeah. you or or disrespect you or leave you alone. And so it produces mm. this general sense of um, anxiety. Mm. And uh, from that anxiety, one of the manifestations, of course, this is classic. It can lead to an insecure attachment. But one of the manifestations is you can distrust joy. The very mm-hmm. thing that can help us to heal. Yeah. We distrust yes. it. Right. And mm-hmm. um, actually in ACUD herself, Brene Brown calls it um, foreboding joy. She actually mm-hmm. has a term that she she coined. Um, so it's not just truly just delighting and joy itself, but foreboding. And again, I think that's rooted in trauma responses that it's when things were going right. There was the yeah. big blow up or... Yeah. Um, it seemed like everything was right. It, the, the rug was pulled underneath ourselves. So again, that's one of the manifestations. If you see that anxiety, again, love yourself. It's to protect yourself. It was to protect the younger self. But as you move yeah. into a healthy relationship, mm-hmm. um, we have to trust the good, lean into the good. Um, don't express every single thing that's a problem um, necessarily out loud. You can take it to God. But, but try to see, like, okay, is this the wound talking or is this the objective situation? Do I need to bring this up because there's something objectively mm. problematic in this relationship? Or is this the wound talking? If it's the wound talking, maybe I need to grieve with my other. Um, mm. But it's not something inherent in the relationship I need to bring up with. And, and that can help resolve. Uh, anxiety can also be, um, yeah, anyways, the, the core is asking where is it coming from? And depending on where it's coming from, there's a different, different remedy. So that's anxiety. Yeah. Now, I know we want to talk about anger. Yes. So I <laughs> got to move quickly. <laughs> sure. Um, anger is also very common in the aftermath of your parents' divorce, separation. Um, I'll just say this. There's righteous anger and there's sinful anger. And mm. um, it is righteous to have some anger, to work through the anger. Not just have some anger, but you can have very intense anger. And um, it's part of the forgiveness process. It's part of the grieving process. It becomes sinful when it's directed at the wrong thing, something true, beautiful, and good, rather than a mm. sinful action. When it's directed in the wrong way, so you know, not just being angry, but raging, insulting, making the other one person fearful for their safety, right? Yeah. Um, or it's done with the wrong intention. It's done mm. for revenge. It's done yeah. for you you wish the other person ruin okay yeah. this is the sinful anger mm. want them to hurt so we cut off that relationship we get like passive aggressive right um compared to expressing our anger in appropriate ways mm. through asserting our hurt and if necessary if there's legitimate hurt there healthy boundaries mm. um which will look different for every relationship and person. And then we have to work through for both anxiety and anger. The other piece, which we can't get into today is we've got to work through the the forgiveness process as well. Yeah. And for those who are, um, identifying with these wounds and are adult children of divorce or separation, or you're married to an adult child, uh, divorce or separation, your best friend is one. Um, all of us know people who are adult children of divorce or separation. For those of you who are like, what's the next step? Where's the healing? How does the healing come in? I'm so glad that you asked. <laughs> you can visit lifegivingwounds.org to join. If you can't go to a retreat in person, uh, which there are various locations that um, Life Gave Me Wounds host in-person retreats, which we obviously highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, but if you aren't able to make it in person, they have an ongoing Wednesday evening online retreat 
for adult children of divorce or separation um, that you can join beginning October 2nd. And you can register for that on their website at lifegivingwounds.org. Obviously, we can't get into the all of the details here uh, on the air, but the last thing, if it's all right with you, Dr. Mayo, the last thing I kind of want to touch on as far as anger is you mentioned wearing anger as a mask. Uh, you talked about anger can be necessary, right? Um, when you say <laughs> anger as a mask, it can it means sometimes that you are masking emotions like vulnerability. Uh, can you leave our listeners with just a little bit um, on that? I think it's really important. Yeah, so often the green anger is unresolved grief and sadness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, that's where you see all these wounds is interconnected. If you've never been able to grieve, you're just going to be angry and you're not going to know why and it's just yeah. going to come out so mm-hmm. one of the things we always want to ask when we have anger is there a sadness or grief under here that's unresolved that needs to be healed that needs to be addressed with yeah. sometimes just allowing people to be sad and to grieve with them can do wonders for resolving that that anger that we don't know where it's coming from mm-hmm. so and you guys do that on your retreats you oh you yeah grieve, i mean that's grieve with your we attendees. grieve yeah. yeah, and and we see a reduction of anger, not just on the retreat, but we then give them the skill like, hey, when this comes up again, maybe think mm-hmm. one of the ways to resolve your anger is grief and talking mm-hmm. about your legitimate needs that weren't met as a yeah. kid or how you would like it to be met now as, as an adult in relationship. Mm-hmm. So with people that can receive the wound, because this is another problem, like our parents might not be capable of receiving yeah. this grieving, yeah, but our spouse... Yeah. Our friends can. And so, again, mm-hmm. to alleviate that anger, uh, one of the great ways to do that is to grieve about what has legitimately hurt you with a friend yeah. and spouse. Yeah, Jesus grieves. And so we can and Jesus, yeah, actually, <laughs> even more importantly, take it to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Visit lifegivingwounds.org to sign up for their upcoming online retreat for adult children of divorce um, or separation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayola, for coming back on the show with us here on The Quest. We really appreciate you, and we'll be continuing to pray for your work and this much, much, much needed ministry that I hope will soon be international. God bless you, and thanks for joining us.